Startup Nation, we tell you all the time that no one does anything great on their own. That includes starting a business or a nonprofit or even becoming a thought leader or an influencer. My point is that you need a team to do it successfully and responsibly. And that is why you should contact DR and Associates. Danielle and her team provide branding solutions along with digital and social media marketing that provide tangible results you are looking for. No matter if you are a Fortune 500 company or an author looking to make an impact, DR and Associates needs to be part of your team. They are one of the few firms whose leadership has been recognized by Google, which is proof of concept that they are very good at what they do. Contact DR and Associates today to grow your online presence. The number is 615-933-3681, or you can visit their website at drandassociates.com. Also, make sure you follow their Facebook page as well. DR and Associates, providing real clients with real results. This week on The Startup Life. So right. how, even as a startup, do you bubble up from that sea of sameness and stand out? Well, it turns out one of the ways to do that, the best ways, is customer experience, is really being thoughtful about the actual experience the customer is having with your brand and not shutting the door on the customer after they, they give you their credit card. All right, Startup Nation, so let's take flight with Blake Michelle Morgan customer futurist and author of The Customer of the Future. The startup life begins now. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. You'll never have me, sacred stone. <laughs> oh, this you crazy mother. The Startup Life is brought to you by Target. No matter if it's household items to make your home more aesthetically pleasing or a 65 inch TV to complete that man cave, Target is the go-to place for high quality products at an affordable price. Start your Target journey with a link in our show notes. Target, expect more, pay less. All right, Startup Nation, so I hope you're ready to receive some value today. We have a superstar on the show today. We have Blake Michelle Morgan, a uh, customer experience expert and author of The Customer of the Future. How's it going, B. Morgan? Oh, hi. Thank you so much. You have so much energy this morning. I can hear it in your voice that you've had a little bit of coffee and you're feeling good. And I've had my coffee too, so I'm awesome ready. Stuff. Awesome <laughs> stuff. Are you ready to pour some knowledge in the startup nation today? I'm going to do the best I can to serve your startup community. I hope I can give them some valuable nuggets and, and live up to that amazing intro. Oh, no, you're going to be just fine. <laughs> you're going to be absolutely awesome. As always, Startup Nation, my name is Dominic Lawson. This is the Startup Life Podcast, and it is powered by the Binge Podcast Network. So, B. Morgan, first things first, let's start this thing off right. Share with us your origin story uh, and how you came to write this, this amazing book we're going to talk about today. I just love that you're calling me B. Morgan. Is that, your, <laughs> is that what you do for your friends? <laughs> You, you know, I, I think it's it's my way of like, you know, kind of like easing the tension of like sometimes are people nervous and stuff like that. And but really mm -hmm. try to establish that connection and rapport right off the bat. At least, you know, OK, a little small. All thing. right. You can call me B. That's cool. All right. I'll do, I'll do that. I'll call you B. Yeah, let's do that. Um, My origin. I will. I'm going to skip the beginning, the youth okay. part, because that, you know, those are growing pains. And you guys don't want to hear about me being a, a teenager, all yeah. unhappy and uh, all that. No. Um, I I went to a school in California and I just had dreams of living a big life like the show Sex in the City. I thought I was going to be a big magazine editor. So I moved to New York City okay. a bit naively and had an internship and the magazine was called Black Book and I did not get a job there. And I realized soon that the print magazine industry was going under. 
So I ended up being recruited by a conference company because I had been a journalist and I produced conferences for a few years and then became friendly with the partner of the company who was looking to turn an old school conference company into a digital media community to support the online, to the support the offline events because he saw what was happening with social media. And this was like 2008, 2009. Right. And so I ended up being the face and the persona of customer management IQ. That's how I got into customer experience. Mm-hmm. I had a podcast show in 2009 and just had a really good time getting my feet wet with blogging, with being an online brand, if you will, when no one was really, no one was really doing that yet. Right. Not at the level we're seeing today. And I just really fell in love with the topic. For a few years, I met my husband and moved to San Francisco from New York. I was tired of the the scene there of New York and kind of struggled for a few years. I took a bunch of different startup jobs and I figured out that the startup thing, it's pretty cool when it's your startup, but Mm. um, if it's someone else's startup, there's a lot of variation. Sometimes your boss is nuts. Sometimes <laughs> the hours are long and thankless. And I figured out, mm, I don't think this is for me. Gotcha. I try to go off on my own and have a um, social media agency mm-hmm. and content agency. And I, honestly, I was just so young. I wasn't really organized enough yet to really run a business successfully. And then I decided I just wanted stability. So I took a job at Intel, the Fortune 100 chip maker. Right. as an executive in customer service because they said, oh, she did all this customer management work. She knows she knows customer service. Uh, to be frank, I didn't want that job. I didn't want to work in customer okay. service. I thought it was really beneath me. I thought, that's not cool. Okay. But I did it to work for a good brand to get that corporate experience under my belt. And then I, after two years left, and I'd started doing a Forbes column in 2014, and I realized, gosh, I just love this thought leadership thing. I just want to do this all the time, this podcasting, speaking. And my husband, Jacob Morgan, was already had already been doing this for many years. So he right. pushed me out of the nest. I said, Jacob, I, I don't know if I can do this. I just want to work for you and build your brand. And he said, no, Blake, you need to do your own thing. And so for the last five years, I've been taking my message of customer centricity all over the world, whether it's in my own podcast or speaking on stages and or my Forbes column and having a really good time. And I just feel really blessed. I've just come out with my second book, The Customer of the Future. And the message seems to be finally really resonating with people. So I I feel just extremely blessed to get to do this and be interviewed by people like you, Dominic. I appreciate that. So you mentioned the book, The Customer of the Future, 10 Guiding Principles for Winning Tomorrow's Business. And Startup Nation, I actually have the book right here in my hand. Thanks to our lovely friends uh, at Hopper Collins Leadership. So I want to start it off with this, B, because, you know, one of the things you really point out, and you, you start the book off on a great note, when you talk about the difference between customer service and customer experience, kind of explain that for Startup Nation a little bit, if you would. So about five years ago, my industry, I got so frustrated with them because they were using the phrase customer service interchangeably with customer experience. Mm -hmm. And everyone listening to this podcast has had a customer service issue. Absolutely. It's unavoidable. But experience, I started to figure out, was much more than simply what happens if your product breaks. It has to do with how you hire, how you train, your engineering, and, and the culture of your company. And so I started to explore this topic increasingly And I just focused on it like a laser for the last five years. The difference is that the experience is the perception the customer has of your brand. But that perception can be shaped by a lot more than the contact center. That perception can be shaped by your marketing, by even your CEO's behavior out in the world, uh, by how closely your engineering team work with customer service because customer service are often an extremely important group that they get the actual feedback from the customer. Like let's say you have an issue with your iPhone. Well, customer service would have all that knowledge about the customer's perhaps unpleasant experience with an iPhone and could, could bring it back to the Apple engineering team and say, Hey, we've got, we need a fix on this product. This is the future that we actually do something with customer feedback. So that's the main difference is just customer service. What happens when products break experience 360 degree approach to customer centricity. 
hear that. Thank you for sharing that. And one of the things that I really took away from that answer, Startup Nation, is that perception. Uh, I think that's really important as you go forth on your path to entrepreneurship and bringing that customer experience to your customers. I appreciate you sharing that, B, for sure. Oh, I'm, I'm happy to because it just, I think it's good for the whole industry to start think, being more thoughtful about customers rather than just thinking of them as costs. You know, if you have a yeah. business, even for your startup community, it, it is more exciting. It seems more exciting to get a new sale than to deal with repeat customers. Right. But the whole point is that today we live in an extremely competitive time where many businesses are facing this reality that their products and services have become commodities. They are simply competing on price. So right. how, even as a startup, do you bubble up from that sea of sameness and stand out? Well, it turns out one of the ways to do that, the best ways is customer experience is really being thoughtful about the actual experience the customer is having with your brand and not shutting the door on the customer after they, they give you their credit card. I hear that. Um, Thank you for sharing that. So Startup Nation, in the book, you know, The Customer of the Future, you know, Blake uses uh, you know, she, she's interviewed some of the most amazing people in the business world, and she has uh, amazing stories uh, that really highlight and emphasize her points and her themes in the book. And Blake, you know, one of the stories that you talk about is the makeup company Sephora and how they went through a transformation and they use tech to enhance that customer experience. Kind of share with us a little bit about how Sephora was able to do that and get the right tone when it comes to customer experience. So Sephora has always been a first mover with customer experience. Mm -hmm. If you remember, um, Dominic, if you ever went to the department store with your, with your mom and she was shopping for makeup, absolutely. there was in the, in you absolutely. So in the old days, and even still today, you go into say a department store, you go up to the makeup counter, there's a, someone guarding the makeup. You have to ask to try <laughs> things. Right. It's very clear who has the power here and it's right. not the customer, but Sephora wanted women and men to be right. able to go into their stores and play with their products, try things on. It's extremely interactive and experiential. And they did that very early on. But they also, in the early 2000s, realized the power of their technology stack and started focusing on innovation very heavily mm. and continue to do that today. But when I wrote this book, I actually took a ferry boat over to Sephora headquarters because I live in the East Bay, for those of you who are familiar with the Bay right, Area. Right. And I went up to downtown San Francisco into a skyscraper to the corner office of the chief technology officer of Sephora. And I had originally set out to write an entire book about technology because I believed it was so important for these companies that are focused on experience because I saw Netflix, Spotify, Amazon, Apple products. I thought, it's a technology piece that the companies are getting right with customer experience. But I interviewed Ali Bauhaus, who's the CTO, very nice guy. And as we're sitting there, I'm asking him questions with my little notepad about customer experience technology. I want to hear about the CTO office. I want to hear about the technology stack. And he does not want to tell me about it. He wants to talk about the customer of Sephora, the makeup store. And she's a teenager and she has really bad acne. And she walks into this Sephora retail store. And she really just wants makeup to cover her acne so she cannot be embarrassed when she goes to parties with her teenage friends. We all know teenagers are, can be brutal. Right. And she wants her, she wants a face cleanser to clear up her skin. And so the point is he's telling me about these human stories that have nothing to do with technology strategy. And so I totally threw out the initial idea for my book. I went back to Harper Collins and said, Hey, this book on technology, I can't write it because it, nobody needs it. We don't need more information about technology. The companies have the technology, but what they're missing is the mindset, the focus on the customer, the company culture. Most company cultures are just trash. The third piece, leadership development. How are we training our leaders during these complicated times to have difficult conversations, to be beacons of strength and hope and to be leaders at a time when people need it. And so I went back to the drawing board and sent them a new pitch with a more broad book about customer experience because this is my second book. Right. But I believe that the world still needed more information about customer experience. Like Sephora has gotten it really right because they do focus on innovation. 
they do focus on technology, but it's not their first uh, move. Their first move is, well, what is the human experience of our employees and our customers? And we're going to start with that and then just figure out what tools we need. But the tools are not the point. For sure. And thank you for sharing that. And, and it's, it's one of the reasons why I wanted to talk to you today, B, because, you know, uh, in, in the conclusion, you talked about exactly that, how you, you was going in with one direction for the book uh, and you came away something totally different when you start interviewing uh, the people and the companies and stuff like that, which is why, and we're going to get into this later, Startup Nation, which is why chapters three and four really resonated uh, with me. Uh, but even going back to the technology uh, part of, of what you're talking about, I think, you know, we all have, you know, some level of technology at our disposal, but at the end of the day, it really is about that human interaction, that human experience. And I really think uh, yeah, she really strikes a great tone in the book Startup Nation for sure. For, thank you for sharing all of that, B. Thank you for reading up to the conclusion. I'm amazed that you <laughs> that so, actually read my book, like I said, the whole you, thing. You had a lot of great, you know, uh, insight in here, you know, that I really wanted to dive in as well. Once again, Startup Nation, we're, we're talking to Blake Michelle Morgan, author of The Customer of the Future and Customer Futures uh, as well. So I want to talk about uh, this because in your book you talk about the zero friction policy where the name of the game is efficiency and you, you know you tout uh, Amazon uh, in the book you know quite often because you know and it makes sense because Amazon has always been known as extremely uh, customer focused that is you know one of the reasons why Jeff Bezos is really successful uh, with his company but let me ask you this you know if I'm a small business owner and I clearly don't have the war chest of a capital that Amazon has how can I use, because one of the points you talk about is uh, using data in customer service. How can I use data in customer service and, uh, and enhance that customer experience model? Yeah, I think customer experience is a great leveler of our time because it really doesn't matter how big or small you are. Right. You still have the power to disrupt with the tools that you have in your mindset. And, you know, for years, Amazon was extremely scrappy. It's almost painful. If you read the story, there's a book called um, gosh, what's the name of this book? I'm going to send it to you for your show notes, okay. but it's one of the big exposés of Amazon where the right, the journalist went into Amazon, met with Jeff Bezos, did all of that. Yeah. I've read that book. Yeah. Yes. It's a book. Everything yeah. store. Thank you so yeah, much. No worries. I'm pregnant, so I can just blame it on pregnancy. Brain. Oh, no. oh, congratulations, by the way. <laughs> Thank congratulations. You. Thank you. But <laughs> you know, if you, you, so you read the everything store, so you saw like how ugly it, it pretty much was for oh, that yeah. company like almost hard to, to stomach just how hard people work. They were packing boxes on the weekends. But the point is, it's really about being clever, being agile, and being focused on the value delivered to customers. Mm. I think there, there are now so many data tools. And even if you're smaller, you actually have, you're more nimble, you're more agile than for these big companies. These big companies have so much data. It's not clean. They don't share it and they actually have a disadvantage because they're so siloed. So I think being small is an advantage and you just have to be clever and nimble with what you do have rather than just focusing on the fact that you're small. I hear that. And, and I appreciate you sharing that because a lot of people, uh, they, they send us emails, you know, to the show and stuff like that. And they say, Dominic, like, you know, you, you bring in amazing you know, guests and stuff like that, man. But like, I don't have the money that these people are talking about, but I really am glad that you highlight that point that it really isn't about the capital that you spend, but it's more so maybe the human capital or the, the human experience or the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the ingenuity and the innovation that you put into it yourself and being creative is what really ultimately that matters. So I appreciate you sharing that. Well, it's about being personal because Absolutely. these big companies, they, they are not per being personal with their customers. Right. And like, even for me, I have my own small business and every person I speak with, I try and really treat them like an individual and practice what I preach and practice what I write about. And so that is your advantage for those of you listening who have small businesses or startups. Every relationship is a chance to shine, a chance to deliver value if you have that servant leadership mentality. And that is your advantage over the big guy because I think people are sick of companies taking advantage of their data, auto collecting data. For me, the biggest offenders, and I hate to say it, but small companies do this even okay. worse than big companies is auto adding people's email emails to your mm. newsletter list and then just sent oh my god guys that 
for me is just like, oh, so offensive. So just being thoughtful, if you can just be thoughtful and treat your community like individuals, that's the advantage you have. But think about, I mean, it's like what your mom told you when you were little. Right. Um, and I have a three-year-old, so I try and instill this on my own three-year-old. Treat right. other people like you would want to be treated. That is really like the essence of customer experience, but no one does it. They don't. They get very caught up in how much money they're making, their next promotion, especially at big companies. Right. Um, their own performance metrics that they forget that they are shaping experiences for other people and they're not very self-conscious of their own behavior. Gotcha. Thank you for sharing that. So I, I want to ask you this because you kind of, you know, we, I was going to ask you about it later, but since we're already here, you talk about the personalization of marketing and stuff like that, you know, the customer of the future. Uh, I, I want to ask you this because look, you know, uh, and I'll just share a quick story. So when I, 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 uh, in a, I mentor, uh, at an entrepreneur program for teenagers every Sunday. And so I have a, a Apple iPhone. And so every time I hop in the car, it automatically knows, okay, there's a lot of, there's not a lot of traffic. It's going to take you about 24 minutes to get to your destination. Well, well, at first when I, when I, when that happened, it was a little creepy, but at the same time, it really does kind of speak to using data and analytics to uh, kind of customize uh, that experience for me as I use my iPhone and stuff like that. So I want to ask you this, uh, as millennials like myself, uh, has become like the adults in the room and Gen Z has started to graduate college and both having more disposable income and companies are trying to target them with their products and their experiences and stuff like that. Where do you see the next evolution uh, of the customer, you know, and how can I take advantage of that as a small business owner? Well, you mentioned that your iPhone knows where you are. It's tracking you, right? right. And um, I think that people are nervous about their That's data. Right. I mean, right. many of us have devices in our homes that are listening to us. We're also simultaneously hearing about hacks. So right. I think a lot of consumers are nervous about their data, clearly, or where they're being tracked or where they're not. You probably get notices in your iPhone that say, Dominic, is it okay that Uber is tracking your location even when you're not using the app? <laughs> you might think, I think I'm good. I don't think I need you knowing that I'm on a, a business trip in New York right now or whatever. Right. So I think it's about being really transparent with customers, thinking of how would you personally want a company using your data or not using it? How would you want to be communicated to? It's probably not through a lengthy terms and conditions agreement that you then have to read a 10 page contract, which none of us do. Right. And so I think that we're seeing that in the past companies have like let their legal team lead <laughs> with with a lot of aspects of customer experience, which are actually terrible experiences. I went to my dentist recently. I looked down when I was signing out and paying for my teeth cleaning and there was probably a 3000 word fine print um, legal notice at the front desk that was like taped to the desk. And I thought, who in the world is reading this? <laughs> it's just these things that we, th we check. We want to check these boxes for our businesses. We want to make sure we're being compliant and we're not going to be sued, but what is the cost to the customer experience? So what I'm seeing now with startups, with innovators and disruptors are companies upstarts coming in and saying, these are terrible experiences. Why are we making customers' lives so hard? Let's just simplify everything and do what we would want to do, how we would want our own families and friends treated and build that experience. It doesn't matter the legacy of the industry. Gotcha. Thank you for sharing all of that for sure. Uh, I want to ask you this before we move on, because in your book, we, you talk about marketing and marketing is always, you know, when it comes to startup founders, small businesses, it's always one of the things that they spend a lot of money on. Uh, one of the things that they always kind of focus on, whether it be Facebook ads, uh, Google Analytics, wherever the, wherever the case may be. Uh, but in your book, you talk about how the future of marketing may not even be marketing at all. Uh, and you talk about Tesla a little bit and even kind of for a certain extent, uh, iPhones kind of the same way, Apple products and stuff like that. Kind of talk about, you know, what does that look like? Like no marketing at all. And how could that be effective in the future? I think if you have a good product, you don't need to actually do that much marketing. And okay. Tesla, I mean, they've been so successful with 
word of mouth. Even recently, they had their new release of their, I think it's like some kind of cyber truck. It's a really right. weird looking truck. And yeah. they had one of their people throw a baseball um, into the window to show that the windows of these trucks were uh, wouldn't break and it broke. Right, right. <laughs> so at first the internet blew up and said, oh, Elon Musk so embarrassed by, you know, this truck window breaking, but really thought, you know, after, after a few weeks, you thought, actually that went viral. So that was pretty smart. Right, was yeah. that, was that, was that a, mar a viral marketing move? <laughs> <laughs> so the point is that good products we find out about today through word of mouth, and we don't always need to have heavy marketing programs. In the past, I think Seth Godin wrote a book, Marketers Are Liars. I think that many consumers don't trust advertising anymore. We don't like it. It disrupts our lives. In the past, we've been forced to watch ads in, in between our favorite TV shows. Now we have on-demand content. We don't need to watch ads anymore. We can pay for subscriptions, so we don't have to deal with, with this um, advertising and content. So increasingly, the consumer is in charge of the content they experience, and it's only the products that are actually good or valuable that are going to make their way into your into the consumer's news feed. So I think that, you know, Elon Musk is a great example. Tesla is a great example of a modern approach to customer experience. He's obsessed with the product. When he was building Tesla models, he knew that customers wouldn't want to drive something ugly. Right. And they feel like that was like not nothing against the Prius or these other cars, but you know, like I wanted a Prius. My husband would have let me because he said that's a dorky car. <laughs> But the Tesla is sexy. It's as cool as a Porsche, drives as fast as a Ferrari. And Elon Musk, it's not an accident. He put more focus into product engineering than he did marketing. Right. And he actually would sleep in the factory for three or four days at a time. And even today, I believe he sits in the middle of his engineering team. And I believe they work in the factory. And he's extremely connected to his engineers and even to the customers where you can tweet to Elon and ask for a specific innovation on the car and he'll Absolutely. do it like dog mode. Like people wanted their dogs to be able to hang out in their Teslas with comfortable um, air conditioning and a note on the tablet that says like, this dog is doing great. Don't worry about this dog in this car with the windows up. And I think that dog mode request went into production. Right. And so all around, this is a company focused on the customer. They are customer focused rather than being product focused. And the focus is on innovation and engineering more so than it is on telling everyone how great they are. And I think that's the future of marketing. It's more about what you do, what you stand for, how you treat customers rather than how loud you can talk. I hear that. Thank you for sharing that. And Startup Nation, in the book, you actually have a screenshot of the inter interaction uh, between Elon Musk and the customer asking for the dog bowl. And Elon Musk simply <laughs> just says, yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. So that I, I think, you know, it wasn't even like a long drawn out thing. He just like, yes, let's do it. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate you sharing that. And once again, Startup Nation, we're talking to Blake Michelle Morgan, author of The Customer of the Future, 10 Guiding Principles for Winning Tomorrow's Business. We have a link in the show notes for easy access to purchase that book. And I'm going to tell you now, Startup Nation, you want to add this to your entrepreneurial toolkit for sure. Now, Blake, before we go to break, I want to ask you about your podcast, Modern Customer Podcast. Kind of share with Startup Nation uh, the, the focus of the podcast and, and the value they get from it when they listen to it. The focus of the podcast is customer experience. I've done about, I think, 180 episodes. Wow. And I interview a lot of practitioners and people who are um, focusing on customer experience in their own businesses. And it is a 30-minute podcast. And if you want to learn more, you can just type into Google the Modern Customer Podcast, and you can find this also on iTunes or Spotify. Absolutely. And Startup Nation, we also have the links in the show notes to go directly to that podcast there in the show notes for easy access. So we're going to go ahead and take a quick break. How do you like being on the Startup Life so far, B? Oh, a lot of energy, a lot of good questions. So I'm enjoying it so far. Awesome stuff. Awesome stuff. <laughs> All right, Startup Nation. So I hope you're getting great value from B's content, but we got to pay a few bills. Once again, my name is Dominic Lawson. This is the Startup Life Podcast, and it is powered by the Binge Podcast Network.
Startup Nation, Kenda and I, along with our daughter Zoe, have this thing called Target Fridays if she's had a good week at school. We stop by the snack bar for popcorn and mermaid ices. Startup Nation, don't judge me until you've tried them. Those ices are really good. Anyways, we then head over to the toy section so my daughter can add to her LOL doll collection. My daughter is a pretty good student, so you can imagine that we have spent a small fortune on LOL dolls. However, I can take solace in the fact that Target makes it affordable to buy those LOL dolls and anything else we need as a family. That's because Target believes you deserve quality at an affordable price. And when you're entrepreneurs like us, that's extremely important. But great deals and quality products are not exclusive to the brick and mortar version of the retail store. Target.com has even more exclusive deals that you can appreciate. And when you spend over $35, shipping is free. And I know we all love free shipping. We love to purchase the amazing kids clothes for Zoe from the exclusive to Target Cat and Jack line when we go online. So the next time you listen to the show and you are reminded that you need something for your home, Start your Target journey with the link in our show notes where you can expect more and pay less. All right, Startup Nation, so let's continue. So B, I, I want to ask you this because, look, you have a very impressive client list that includes Comcast, Adobe, Verizon Wireless, Allstate, and more and more and stuff like that. So when they contact you to come to their businesses to talk to the executive leadership team or the C-suite to talk about how to reach customers and stuff like that, are they contacting you before there's a problem? Or are they contacting you when the sky is falling? Either way, what's your <laughs> approach uh, when you engage with your clients, if you don't mind? Yeah, I think they've made a decision to often communicate to their employees or their customers about customer experience. And that's when they bring me in. Right. I don't do a lot of consulting. I usually come speak to companies that already understand that they need to focus on customer experience. Maybe they're doing it well or they really feel like they need a reminder and they need to hear, they need some really inspiration and motivation. I feel in a way I'm Tony Robbins for the business world or, um, because I, they bring me in to tell stories to get people excited about serving customers. Mm -hmm. And so in a way I'm kind of like a performance coach speaker for, for businesses. So they bring me in usually after they've realized that they need to work on things. I wouldn't say that many companies are doing customer experience perfectly across the board. A lot of these companies, they might want me to promote them, but I don't do a lot of speaking to like Nordstrom or Amazon or Ritz Carlton because they are, they already are talking about it internally. They don't really need my help. Even yeah. though I have relationships with them, right. I'm not the first person they'll bring in as a speaker. I'm curious about this, just to kind of get your take on it, because you, you talked about how there are many uh, uh, organizations out there that don't get the customer experience right, which I think to some of us who are not in those uh, those organizations, fascinating. Like, look, they're big, they're successful. Uh, they have a war chest of marketing dollars and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. How come even still, when we talk about some of those organizations, they still get it wrong? Why do you think that is? I think a lot of these companies are the, just the, they're, they have the benefit of being, being big, like mm -hmm. airlines, for example. Gotcha. Most big airlines still are terrible with how they treat customers, but thanks to, they have regulation on their side. It's extremely hard to just start a new airline. <laughs> and right, so, for sure. For sure. Yeah. And they haven't. And so because they're just so big, um, they haven't had to compete. But even these big companies now are starting to be disrupted, like in cable, insurance, mm. healthcare by the, the startup community, which I think right. is really exciting. So even the big companies with the war chest that you speak of, they're starting to sweat because they're seeing these disruptors come in and completely do everything differently in a way that's more sensible, that focuses on customer experience. And, and they're achieving success and they are taking market share from these big guys. So you can be big, but that no longer will protect or insulate you from uh, outside competitors. For sure, for sure. And Startup Nation, just to reference the book one more time, uh, you know, uh, uh, B has amazing stories uh, for us from the big brands that do get it like right. Uh, like a, a Capital One, for instance, who sent flowers to an ex-boyfriend, but I don't want to spoil it because you need to get the book. Uh, but, it's a, but it's a fascinating story about going above and beyond, uh, not just customer service, but providing a customer uh, experience as well. Now, one of the things, B, I wanted to ask you about the book, and I promise it's the last time I ask you about the book, even though I'm pretty sure you don't mind. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you was about some of the themes, and there's chapters three and four that really stood out uh, to me. 
in particular, developing customer focused leadership chapter uh, three, if you will, because you talked about some of the traits like decision making, forward thinking and companies having developing these leaders. But the one that stood out to me was delegating. And I want to read a quote from the from that part. It says, quote, the, comp- the best companies today develop leaders who know how to give responsibilities to other people. They do not cre- take credit for the ideas of underlings, but support their people and give them credit when the work is done, end quote. So that made me, got me to thinking because I remember reading a documentary or watching a documentary about how the U.S. won the first Gulf War and how one of the differences was that the generals gave their subordinate officers like you know the ability to make decisions on their own as opposed to on the iraqi side uh they everything had to come from the top and Mm -hmm. so i I guess what i'm curious about when you talk about customer uh engagement customer experience do you find it surprising sometimes that some of these principles in your book and some of the principles that you speak about are relatable even outside of the business world? Because I can see this working in schools and other facets as well. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, I love documentaries myself. Mm -hmm. And um, you watched a documentary about the Gulf War. My dad's girlfriend, I remember, was a sergeant in the Mm -hmm. Gulf War. Pretty crazy. But that we're not going to talk about that. For sure. For sure. Um, <laughs> but yes, I think empowering people as a customer, you know, when you have a problem, there's nothing more frustrating than when you're you're upset, you call the contact center and they apologize, but you know that it's just a scripted empty apology because that agent really has no power to do anything for you. Right. So it's almost worse when they say, We're so sorry, when you know they're not and they they can't really do anything. So I think one of some of the best companies just empower their people to get things done. Like Capital One, you mentioned that sent flowers to a customer's ex who had just dumped her to make it look like she was still right. People were hot for her. Right, right. <laughs> and um, yeah, the best companies they don't they don't hold on to power. They they hire good people. Like Pixar, I love their leadership strategy where Absolutely. they really just hire great people, train and develop them, and then look for obstacles that get in the way of these great people. They don't have this non-trusting attitude where we need to approve everything, like every tweet or message needs to be looked at by a manager. It just really ruins the customer experience. So hire smart people, give them guardrails, but empower them to actually problem solve for customers and your customer experience will improve greatly, just like they do at Capital One. But the, what's required is this culture of trust and kindness. And mm-hmm. often you don't have it at these big companies. What I have seen is that companies with founder CEOs are better at this because they don't care about the board. They're not obsessed with every dollar. They're willing to make long-term investments and be misunderstood for short periods of time. And even Capital One is actually only a 32-year-old bank. You'd be surprised because they're extremely successful and think they're responsible for like billions or trillions of dollars of of assets. But they are run by Richard, this is going to kill me, either Fairbank or Fairchild. And I will put that in the show notes. But he, pregnancy brain again, but he- he really um, invests in customer experience, as do a lot of founder CEOs. Like a lot of the companies I've mentioned that I like to write about because of their innovation strategies, Netflix, Spotify, Amazon, they all have founder CEOs. And these CEOs don't care about their head being chopped off by the board because it's their company. So they're willing to say, nope, we're not going to simply focus on quarterly profits. We're going to make the long-term investments required to transform our company so we can be sustainable and we we can compete in the future gotcha thank you so much and you actually had it right the first time it is fair bank so you're you're right on oh yeah okay. you had it you thank had you it. no worries <laughs> no worries so uh, i want to ask you this because you know uh talk about you know because you were working at a, at, a, at a fortune 100 company and stuff like that uh but you know clearly you knew you wanted to transition out of and do your own thing and stuff like that. Talk about that transition from corporate America to venturing out and doing your own thing and that process, if you would, a little bit. I did not fit in in the corporate world. I think I'm unemployable. Fair enough. I'm one of these people that 
I just want to help so much. I want to change every, I think I'm going to save this company. And they honestly, these big companies often don't like people like me mm. because I disrupt them. I, um, I'm trying to come up with innovate, innovative ways to doing business. They have their legacy approaches and these people have worked at these companies for 30 years and they don't appreciate somebody coming in and say, Oh, wait, there's a better way. Um, and so actually I was laid off from this company Got you. and it was the best thing that ever happened to me because they gave me about six months worth of income and I could actually just start focusing on building my business right. and advice for other people who want to do the same, start building your business on the side and eventually you'll, you'll be doing well enough where you can leave and go out on your own, be scrappy. Um, that's a lesson from Amazon. They're extremely scrappy absolutely, even today. So in some ways, so that's my advice is to start, start small. Um, and then eventually you can just leave your company and go off on your own. Um, but also be, be cautious. You don't want to spend all of your capital up front because, um, there might be months or even years when you don't really make money. And so that's something you also have to get used to. For sure. For sure. Thank you for sharing that. So you mentioned your husband earlier, Jacob Morgan, who does kind of similar work to what you do. And he's the author of the Employee Experience Advantage. I want to ask you this. Uh, have you guys ever disagreed? Since your work is very similar to one another, have you guys ever disagreed about philosophies and how supportive has he been on your journey? <laughs> <laughs> we're actually, I'm so excited. We're launching our own podcast together. Nice. Um, well, I'm not going to tell you the name yet because we're going to okay. announce it, but it's for okay. entrepreneurs. So okay. hopefully your audience actually would benefit from hearing because we talk a lot about some like really ugly things that have happened to us and okay. our own advice, our own journeys too. Absolutely. So yeah, Jacob is great. He is extremely supportive. I'm always thanking him publicly because he, you know, I, I told him recently, he knows where all the bodies are buried. I mean, he, when you're married and you have kids and you have businesses together and you started at the bottom together, um, I mean, there's no way I could do this without his support. Mm -hmm. I think who you marry is just so important, especially for entrepreneurs because Absolutely. it often um, can be really hard or stressful and you need someone who's going to support you. But Jacob, um, he, he start when I met Jacob, we met at a conference in Atlanta and neither of us really had much money mm -hmm. and he, but he was clearly smart. I married him cause he's sweet, not because he was rich or anything. He yeah. wasn't, <laughs> I just, <laughs> I was so sick of all these New York guys. He, here's a sweet guy who really likes me. And I, I just fell for him quickly. That. That's not what you guys are here to hear about. Um, <laughs> Jacob was already doing a lot of content and thought leadership. He actually started doing SEO, which is so weird for him. Okay. He moved, he was doing what I was doing, which was customer strategy. But um, we had an issue actually, I won't go in the details, but there were like a group of like 20 analysts. They're all friends and they all didn't like Jacob. They kind of started bullying him online. And he just slowly but surely pivoted to another um, angle, which was more employee experience and human resources. There's a new book coming out. But he's a, he works extremely hard. And, you know, we both, I think, if you listen to our podcast, we'll talk. I mean, we both had to fake it till we made it. I think he used to be a lot more shy. Um, he's, he's done a lot of good stuff. Like you see his speaking reel. He's done events with 3000 people, but I mean, he also was kind of shy and we we've, we've coached and helped each other along the way. He also pushed me like my first book didn't do that well. It did okay, but it didn't do great. Right. He pushed me to write a second book. Um, he pushed me, as I said, I wanted to work for him because I thought, God, I, I'll never be a speaker. I can never do any of this. I'm so shy. I'm so introverted. And he, he pushed me and said, you, you have to try and um, I think it's so important to have someone like that in your life, whether it's your spouse, your mom, your best friend, your girlfriend or boyfriend, because there are days where you just get down on yourself and you just get so tired. You feel like, oh, this is just too scary because being an entrepreneur or startup, you, you are on your own. There's no one there to catch you if you fall. So you need a little support system around you and you need sources of joy as well that are not related. Like for Jacob, I won't talk too much more about him because I feel like I'm going on and on about my husband and how cool he is. But I did ask, so. 
<laughs> he loves chess. He spends hours and hours every week playing chess. He is like a chess coach. And that for him is his release. Also the gym, he likes to work out, but outside of work, cause he does work a lot. And so I think that's really important for everybody listening that you have community, you have support and you have hobbies, like fun things that you do away from the computer, whatever it is you're building. So you can come back fresh and replenished and able to focus. Got you. Thank you for sharing all of that for sure. Now, I know you said you were pregnant. Once again, congratulations as well. Mm -hmm. But I want to ask you about your three-year-old daughter. If I were to ask her uh, what you and your husband did in her own words, what would she, <laughs> what would she tell me? You know, one day I picked her up from her preschool and I just mm -hmm. said, you know, Naomi, mommy loves you so much. I don't know what happened. Maybe she had a problem at school or something. I said, you gotcha. know, mommy loves you so much. And I'm so proud of you. And I just was going on and on. And she said, mommy, are you doing a speech right now? <laughs> it was so funny <laughs> because I never heard her say the word speech, but that is part of my job. So I think she does get some things. She knows when we go on trips, she's like, is mommy going on the airplane now? And then we'll call, I'll call her when I get to the hotel wherever I am. And she'll say, mommy, are you on the airplane? Like she doesn't really understand the concept of business travel, but I'll right. show her my yeah. hotel room. And I do always FaceTime her wherever I am. My husband and I are partners. So yeah. we really, we aren't usually traveling at the same time. So Jacob is Naomi, my daughter knows dad is just as good as mom and, yeah. and can do all the things mom can do. And so now like I've been having to travel since she was six months old. And so not a lot, but you know, it's hard to leave even if it's just for a few days, but she doesn't cry when I leave now. She's really fine. So I think if you have little kids, it's actually good for them to know that when you leave, you come back and you are connected. And so it, you aren't um, handcuffed, like you can build the life you want, even if it's not always convenient, you can make it work and your children can be supportive. If you treat them, well, not like adults, but you help right. talk to them about it and even include them in what you're doing and building so they get excited too. I hear that. I hear that. Uh, so B, let me ask you this. If you could have a cup of coffee with anyone in the past or present, who would they be and what would you ask them? You know, someone actually already asked me this question and I love my answer so much. I'm going to give you the same Okay. One. All right. And the answer, there's three people. All They're right. all live, luckily. So they hear this, maybe they'll call me. All right. The first one is Beyonce because I saw her in concert in maybe 2013 mm -hmm. and I was so moved by her energy, her power um, her unapologetic presence for sure. and obviously she's extremely talented. Her voice is absolutely beautiful, but I think for young girls, young women, it's so important to have role models of women who are out in the world, you know, being different and owning their space and having opinions. And, um, so for me, like seeing her in concert, I've just always loved her music when actually, when I get ready for a speech, you know, you have your your psych up music that you listen to to get pumped. I love her song formation from Coachella. It's like okay. TMI for your listeners, but no maybe worries. if you have somebody <laughs> likes Beyonce, they'll be like, Oh yeah, I love that. Um, the other two, I also like Mel Robbins. Okay. Absolutely. Um, she has three kids. She's one of the most booked female speakers in the world. I think her content is just really real and raw and genuine. And her speaking, everything she does, I just think is really tasteful. And she is extremely level-headed. And I think when you are a mom and you have so much responsibility, it can be really stressful. But she just seems to have a cool head on her shoulders. So I appreciate Mel Robbins. And the third is Reese Witherspoon. Because again, I love what she's doing for women. Her documentary called Shine On on Netflix which is amazing. It has like 10 interviews with interesting women. Um, even like the first, I don't know if the word is leader of the cadets in this young woman oversees 4,400 cadets at West Point. Right. Um, and then a bunch of other people like Dolly Parton and America Ferrara, Ferraro. Oh, I'm mispronouncing her name. But anyway, so women who are doing interesting work, um, telling women's stories that are maybe not what you would normally hear. And so I just really appreciate these people because for me, my whole life I've looked for documentaries 
and stories about people or women doing interesting things that are off the beaten path um, and hearing their stories and being inspired by them um, for me in my own life to continue to show up, be brave and do things that um, I might not be totally comfortable doing at first. Gotcha. Gotcha. Thank you for sharing all of that. B, I believe all entrepreneurs have a superpower. What's yours and why? My superpower is listening. I have always been introverted and I've realized as I've gotten older that being introverted and I know and sensitive, most people don't want to admit they're sensitive. I am sensitive. So being perceptive and intuitive has been a nice side effect to being sensitive. So if I go into a room, I have this like freakish antenna on my head Mm -hmm. and I can pick up the molecules in the room and often predict things that will happen and see things that other people wouldn't see because I'm so in tune with what's happening around me. And, you know, it's not always easy to be introverted. Um, Talking and being around lots of people can be very exhausting. Like when I give a speech, sometimes it can feel like running a marathon. (laughs) I get very tired, but people who are introverts often have good stories because they really are good readers and listeners. So my superpower is um, being intuitive, being sensitive as well. I hear that. I hear that. Thank you for sharing that as well. So before I ask this last question, B, I just want to say thank you so much for coming on the show. You provided amazing value uh, about, you know, uh, the customer of the future, your, your book out now. We have a link in the show notes for Easy Access Startup Nation for you to purchase that book. But just also your insight on entrepreneurship and small business and stuff like that. So I really appreciate that. And Startup Nation, if you ever need to contact uh, Blake Michelle Morgan, we have her contact information in the show notes. We also have her website there as well. So if you're at an organization and you need some help with customer experience, give her a call. Her information is there in the show notes as well. B, I'm actually going to turn the microphone over to you because look, there's an entrepreneur out there that's feeling stuck in their business or they're afraid to even start. Give them some words of motivation and tell them to keep moving forward, B. I think you have to believe in yourself. One of the things that always makes me feel better when I feel nervous or I'm getting down on myself or I look at other people and I think, well, look at like Mel Robbins. She's so accomplished. Who am I? Everybody puts on their pants the same way. Um, A lot of really successful people, they don't talk about how many times they failed. And I think it's important to know that everybody's human. We all fail, but it's about getting up more times than you get knocked down. That's going to make you successful. It's just that resilience. And so you have to find ways to tap into your resiliency source, whether that's, again, community, Um, hobbies, people around you who love you, going out and meeting other people that are doing interesting things. And that will help inspire you and, and, and help you to realize that all these people that are achieving great things, they started often from scratch. And that's actually what gives them extreme powers because they are extremely resilient and they don't wait around for people to, to give them the approval or the okay or the green light to do something. They just feel it deep within themselves and they realize that everybody's human and it's okay to make mistakes and fail. I hear that. Thank you so much. And that's going to wrap up this session of the Startup Life. Did you enjoy being on the show, B? I did. I had so much fun, Dominic. Thank you so much. Awesome stuff. I right, Startup Nation, final take. B gave some amazing value on today's episode, but there's a few things that I kind of want to highlight. I think the biggest one is that like, even though she went in thinking of trying to write a book about you know, the tech side of providing customer experience, but it ultimately boils down to what the CTO of Sephora said. It it has nothing to do with tech. It has everything to do with taking a holistic 360 approach to providing that customer experience, going above and beyond. And I think in your business startup nation, that's important to remember. There is no silver bullet. There is no cookie cutter option when it comes to customer experience. It all goes down to understanding what your market wants, understanding what your market is looking for, and providing that uh, on the highest level possible. But also, it's important to understand, and and she talks about this in the book, that that leadership piece is so important. So if your managers understand that, that trickles down to the team members, which ultimately trickles down to the most important person in this equation, the most important stakeholder in this equation, the customer. If you want to let us know what you think about our show, have an idea for a show topic, or would like to advertise on our show, send us a message on the Startup Life Podcast Facebook page. 
And while you are there, like and follow our page as well. It's a great way for us to engage with you, Startup Nation, and really grow our community. The link is there in the show notes. Subscribe to the show as it can be heard on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, or even on your Facebook timeline or any other platform you like to get your podcast. If you are listening on Apple Podcasts and you find our content valuable, please give us a five-star rating as it will help us climb the charts and help more people find our show. You can also listen to the show on the Startup Life Podcast new website. There you will find the all-new startup blog where I write on many topics that are interesting and helpful to you on your path to entrepreneurship. And hey, if you have an idea, be about that life, the startup life. Come in.